And now we move to our next presenter. Okay, and uh, I would like to uh, present the next speaker. I think uh, it's Dietmar Kieper. Kieper. Yes, hello, Valerie. Can you hear me? Yes, and the title is What trees use were used in the pre trees age? A study on an aircraft engineering project. Okay, Dietmar, the screen is yours. Okay. So can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Ah, hello. Um, so today I will uh, discuss a study, what we did uh, with three persons or me, uh, Bernd and Tobias. So we did a study on um, which kind of TRITS tools were used in the pre-TRITS uh, age. And we used here an aircraft engineering project. And um, yeah, the motivation was the following, that usually TRITS is based uh, on the analysis of plenty of patents. Uh, starting in the end of the 40s to 70s until 70s and really all the street stuff was um, rolled out more to the public. Um, but today, of course, when you start a construction design work with new machines, usually you use to very often use tools like TRITS, FMEA, DFMA, design thinking, and or is it Wikibox. So there are many technological tools which were developed, uh, especially during the end of the, um, from the middle to the end of the last century. However, which kind of techniques were used, uh, especially trits related tools in the pre trits age. So it means before the 40s or beginning of the 40s. And this is especially interesting for looking at more technical complex uh, systems like an airplane. Um, and in this case, we used actually the study of the development process for a um, Bloman Force BV 222. It was a flying boat, quite huge at that time. Um, the reason was simply using this one because here, you not only find the boat itself or some drawings, but especially um, by the people who invented and constructed it, very many descriptions in the way how they did it and how they solved problems and which kind of approach they were using. So you can find in these kind of descriptions, many, many um, yeah, study points, which we'll look out in more detail during the study and, um, and see which is trits like or has show other kind of techniques. So I will start now with the, some briefly a background about um, the historical status uh, of the airplane development in the mid thirties and which type of airplanes were used. Um, furthermore, we will then give a brief introduction in our study. It was a core of our study to look at the description of different type of parts of the airplane they developed and how they did it. Uh, and so in the summary, we can go in, give a summary, which kind of trits tools were used, which we could identify and which also other tools were used, which was very surprising for us. And in the end, I give a short conclusion. So the historical status of the thirties or mid thirties. So usually um, this kind of large passenger ships, like I call it now Titanic style, uh, usually they were dominating the passenger traffic uh, over the Atlantic. So I'm focused now mainly on the Atlantic. So for means from Europe to United States, US or to South America. And anyway, this traffic takes whatever, one week, two weeks, depending on which kind of ship you have and so on. But this was a dominating um, way of transportation. However, competitors were approaching, especially for post traffic, but this was mainly done by so-called float boats. Um, so a bit smaller airplanes, but for posts, you don't need so much weight. It's maybe half a ton then it's very sufficient for all the letters you can transport over the Atlantic. However, for passengers, it was appearing now to get down the say one to two weeks to maybe a couple of days only uh, by using this Zeppelin approach, which was at this time at the beginning or middle of the thirties quite uh, reasonable successful, call it this way. However, there was an incident uh, in May, 1937, the incident at Lakehurst when this hint, uh, the airship LZ129 exploded. I, maybe you know these pictures from the explosion and it is where 97 uh, no 35 or so 97 people were killed or the other way around 64 actually survived this explosion which i think is very amazing if you see the pictures however this was really a um, sudden death of this kind of technology for passenger transport so the people were looking for new alternatives and here uh, lufthansa who were running successfully post traffic they say they spoke with them with Bloom and Foss and ordered three uh, large airplanes for the transatlantic passenger in post-traffic transport for the class of more than 90 persons. And um, that was basically the start for the development project. 
And just to give a picture how the airplanes were looking like. So this actually was um, the so-called um, BFAL 139 um, or 38, there's different numbers for the airplane. It is actually this type of flying boat. So you see a classical airplane, as you know it almost like today, but it has now four engines, uh, but here a big float at the bottom of it. And it worked the way in the transatlantic in the way that it were just starting in Europe somewhere, uh, maybe landing in front of one some islands, the Spanish islands, getting refueled, then fly a bit further, a couple of thousand, maybe one, two thousand kilometers further, landing in the Atlantic, then were refueled on this kind of ship here. So they put it up with a crane on the ship, tank it, maybe some service, exchange of the pilot, and then it fly again. And then some days later, it were going back again. So it really requires uh, refueling in the Atlantic because there were just no airports. So it was the reason why they were using flying boats or flying other airplanes which can land on the water. Um, and this was basically the motivation for Lufthansa to go with Blow and Foss to develop the new airplane because this airplane was, or their service, very successful. Just to give an impression, it was also before tried with other boats like this one here, the Dornier X from the 20s to make it even larger, to get some air traffic with passengers. You see here the holes inside for the passengers, but actually this airplane, you see it looks more like a ship, not like an airplane from the form. And it has this big uh, stabilization uh, parts and on top the engines were on top of it uh, to, so to be very far away from the water, not to be destroyed or maybe damaged by water splashes. So, but anyway, this airplane was definitely not a, not a commercial success. It was difficult to fly and so on. And worth to mention that at the same time, the so end of the 30s, beginning of 40s, many other companies were also starting to evolve other larger airplanes like this one here from Boeing, Boeing Clipper from uh, 38. They were starting in 1938, so one year later. And you see also many aspects are the same, but here you see, for example, they still have this stabilization uh, um, elements for the water. So just to coming to the project, so this is actually the airplane, how it looked like. So it was... Um, at that time, yeah, you see here, uh, it's quite skim, or no, you see it better, it's actually relatively slim, relatively long for that time for uh, other airplanes, you see six engines. And um, that was the airplane we had talked about now and what was the basis for our study. So what was the study like? So basically, um, we have a couple of, say, parts of the airplane, which is discussed deeply in the reports about it, uh, which were mainly the type of airplane using the engines, uh, the water compati um, compatibility, especially the size of the hull, and afterwards the shape of the hull, especially for starting landing on this focus, a couple of aerodynamic effects, the wings itself, outboard floats on the wings, uh, control system and control, yeah, control rods. So a couple of fields that were discussed in, in detail, how they developed them. And um, so for example, type of airplane. So yeah, I've seen that the airplane Lufthansa was using was a, boat with floats. And of course, you can think about in the mid thirties, there were also land-based airplanes. Um, like for example, you know, the D Dakota airplane or uh, these kind of things, but all the overhead tail wheels uh, and, and problem was for land-based airplanes for the long distance, there was a lack actually of airports. So usually when you want to travel this long distance, you have to land somewhere and get refueling and then start up again. So basically for this type of airplane at that time, there was no Intercontinental, intercontinental capacity. Um, so then they went out for some water-based airplanes. So there were two alternatives, either with floats or flying boats. And the floats was more, say, used, they had more experience with it. Um, but of course they can do landing and refueling of water, which was very good for intercontinental traffic. Whereas the flying boats at that time was a complex large airplane like the Do-X and actually this airplane was not successful. So usually you assume they go for airplane with floats. However, the requirements were, you want to have a reliable airplane, of course, for long distance, large distance, and it's also a large payload. Otherwise it's commercially not, not successful. Um, but what means? So it means actually when you go for large distance, you need refueling capability. And at that time, that means only that you can land, have to land on water because there are no airports. Um, and on the other hand, large payload means that you require very large floats. You know, we've seen the, the picture before, but if you increase the floats, you of course, you increase the weight and also increase the air resistance resulting in very low, lower distances. So basically in this way, they use the hull itself as a float as it was already done by the flying boat. But so basically in this way, they 
go over to the flying boat and take this as a starting point and start to optimize it, improve it to come out with a reliable large distance airplane. So aspects they were looking at for terms of the engines. It's also a question of reliability and refueling. So instead of using only four engines, they went for six engines. Um, the reason was mainly due to yeah, reliability reasons um, that you have on one hand a lot of thrust, but you can also still continue flying when a couple of the engines just break in the Atlantic. So, and this is some kind of concept with segmentation. So if one breaks, you can still continue. And actually the segmentation concept continues very much also in all the supply of the engines. So they have separate fuel tanks, separate lubricant, lubricant tanks. So each engine has its own supply, but of course, in case they can also be pumped their fuel from one tank to the other one. But in this way, they are very large segmented to see that one compartment is working and the other one can also work if one is fails, the others are still work, uh, working. So the segmentation aspect uh, was used here very much. Um, and another aspect that described also why using this type of engines they were going for, because at that time the engines for um, fuel, classical fuel, they had much high, higher power compared to diesel engines for airplanes, but actually they used diesel engines. And the reason was simply they want to, if you want to do refueling in the Atlantic, then you have the same fuel as the ship has. So basically the principle of local resources was in the background to say, look, I use that, what I have in the Atlantic. Um, looking now at the water compatibility. So the size and shape of the hull. So typically at that time, it's the flying boats, if you have it, um, they have a length to width ratio of six. So it means actually they're very wide um, because somehow you can understand it because they just come from a boat. So they're approaching from boat. So a boat swims much better if it's wide and not small. Um, but however, um, if you have it in this way, uh, the, um, yeah, if you have a large width, of course, in the swimming properties are good, but uh, it diminishes the air, water, and uh, air and water resistance. So in this way, it's a definitely a disadvantage. So in this way, they did some work on it. It was more, as I described it, they see the problem, so the, contract, uh, the contradiction, but then it was more some optimization of the hull. So with a lot of testing and so on, and then they end up with a ratio of 12. So uh, length to width ratio of 12. Um, another important aspect they described uh, in the talk was if they built the hull, you can see maybe here the airplane fly. So usually you would expect that in the middle, it's a bit wider, and then you get a little bit smaller. Um, because this way the aerodynamics is getting better, but they decided for to go always for compartments with the same parts. So in this way, you see here the inner structure of it. It's almost very simple rectangular things. Um, and so that was more a construction aspect they do or in reliability aspect to use always the same parts and the whole airplane is built in the same manner. So from the beginning to the top, you have very long part with the same um, building scheme. Another aspect now for the engine position. So you have seen before the other airplanes, they place everything on top of it. Um, and usually the engine should be far away from the water line to enabling to hit no, no splash of water. But if the engine is far away, uh, but on the other hand, um, the engine should be close to the hull. So basically to improve the aerodynamics, uh, so have a low air resistance. So in this way, what to do, how to avoid that when the airplane is in the water that all the water splashes come there. So that, this is also used by more than say, optimization approach. Um, it was clearly mentioned this one, but they use an optimization approach to, to optimize the shape of the hull here. You see the way that if it goes to the water, that really water is going out to the side and not to the top. So it's some kind of principle, we call it local quality. But in this way, by improving the local quality, they could avoid to, to this kind of this extra uh, additional uh, swimming supports in the airplane, which you have seen on the other airplanes. So really focusing on this local quality, then you could improve it and um, apply this uh, principle. So the aerodynamic aspects. So usually when, of course, when you build a large airplane, uh, you need large um, rudders, vertical tates acquired. Now, um, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, usually when you have large airplanes, then large rudders, vertical tates are acquired. Um, oh wait. Um, no. Oh no, okay, yeah. So usually when you have this large um, 
rudders and vertical tails, they should be very huge. And of course, then you need high forces. But if you need high forces, then it's very difficult for the pilot to fly the airplane. So they really, in this way, they really described the, um, this contradiction, really wrote it, verbally uh, written it, that basically small pushing angels um, means that um, small manual forces uh, should be required during flight. But, uh, and at the same time, larger pushing angels or larger forces during normal flight uh, are required when you do the failure of the engine. So how to bring it together, uh, these kind of requirements. And um, they came up uh, with a way to, to by segmentation. So basically the ruders are very often put into two parts. So one small one, and this one is like, behaves almost like for a small airplane uh, for normal situation and a larger one for this non-normal situation, like when one engine, one of the six engines is broken, then you have only two engines on this side, three on the other one, of course, then you have by the steering force to compensate for this one. So you could compensate, but in normal flight, it's easy to fly. And that was the way how they did it to, to really make it easy also for pilots to learn to fly on the airplane, because in the usual case, you have only low forces and in Worst case, then you have to apply the big forces. Um, on the other hand, now looking at the wings. So you see here, there's the wings shown and you see in the, in the wings, there are all the engines here placed. So this is a very big weight and they have a superstructure in the wings going from one side of the airplane to the other one. It's actually shown here with this big um, um, steel tubular bar in this way. So uh, the reason is uh, they went for the tubular bar at, I think it's not described as a, as a contradiction how they came to it. It's more like we use it because it has many advantages. That's the way how they introduced it. Um, but they show in the way how they build it, there are many aspects of um, say trits like aspects. So for example, it's not just a bar like this with the same diameter, but it's um, it's actually shaped from, from the way it's shaped. So basically it's not over, all over the same thickness of this tubular bar, depending on mechanical forces, some area is uh, thicker, some area is less thick. So in this way, it's some kind of optimization of the, um, of the weight of it. Um, in this way, you get also the weight down. But interesting is then more the aspect, how they use it. Actually, they implement this one as uh, to have multiple use of, the, of this uh, tubular bar, and especially they use it as a fuel tank. So basically they have here six or three apartments on this side, three on the other one for the, for the fuel tank for the engines. But it's very smart because in this way you just skip the fuel tanks and you have already a very huge amount of volume here. Um, and in addition, now this makes also the const overall construction of the wing easier because you put the engines on this tubular bar and around it you have just the shape of very simple things to, to form the wings itself. Um, so in this way you get, a, it's more not a trit thing, it's more like a manufacturing thing, but to have many same parts so you can build um, the uh, wing itself. And now comes another approach problem. If you take a look um, on the airplane, if you see here, so if you want to land on water, of course it can shake uh, the wings. And of course you have to avoid that this uh, wing comes into the water. So to avoid it, uh, the typical approach was to have this kind of outboard floating wings out at the airplane, uh, very far in the outer tips to avoid that the uh, wings go down. And the purpose is simply that doing swimming, especially start and landing when there are more yeah, mechanical forces uh, on the ship, especially when the, the water is windy and there are some waves and that the wings does not hit the water because in case you start and then you start to get um, velocity and then you, the, the, the wing comes and hits the water, uh, you get really a problem. So you have, then you have a sudden stop and uh, turn around and an accident. So these are very crucial uh, for the airplane itself. So what to do? But of course, in the main problem that he described it is when you have a large heavy airplane it requires large floats. Uh, and, but the wing floats, the other hand should be small to reduce the air resistance. So this kind of contradiction, they, uh, they've not formulated really clearly as contradiction, but actually from the context, you see that they have this kind of optimization in mind. And what, what they clearly worked out that, um, that it's a time issue. So you can separate the issue in time. On one hand, you need a big float when you land on the water, but in the air, you don't need it. So what you do, you build some kind of rejecting the outboard floats into the wings. So some kind of nested doll principle. And they come actually very far. So you don't see really this uh, the intermediate step here. They really come to the second issue because if you have a big um, outboard float, bring it to the wing. Of course, and the wing must be very big in the tips of the wing. 
which is also not good and it doesn't help so much. So that's why they segment it again and have it here separated. And then they, but what's then described again regarding the shape of the um, segments. You see here, it's more like a dynamic for the water and the inner part is a bit more optimized than for the air transition. So the optimization of the side uh, of the wing when it, when it need to be used. And this is uh, clearly written here in the text. Um, so also clearly some traits like um, sec um, aspects they're using. Another aspect for controlling, we found it uh, usually when the same when you have a large airplane, large size of the rules, and they require large forces. So there's now an, another um, application to reduce the forces. So it's more like a, um, on one end, of course, the high forces, you can reduce it by implementing technologies at that time, which were already used partly, like uh, replacing mechanics or using additional energy. So these kind of things you can do. So like, for example, using hydraulic systems. Interesting is that he also described it, that they discussed it internally to do it or not, but uh, they decided against it because it would mean at that time, uh, electronics or uh, hydraulic were not so reliable, at least seem not as so reliable. Um, so in this way, that was the reason why they neglected to, neglected to do it, uh, but they really described it as a solution, but instead they used something else. Of course, as described before, the proactive measure was the segmentation of the area and the rudders into two, one part, one large part and small part, but still as a large part still had the same issue. It was like high force you need. So what they used here was a solution which was already existing since I think beginning of the twenties. It was a so-called flattener ruder. Uh, so this was not invented by them, but it was only applied by them. Uh, and it's, I just want to show it, it's an interesting thing. It's actually used still today in very small airplanes sometimes. It works the way when you want to steer this direction, so you pull in this way, then the air comes into this one, so you get a force in this direction. But I have it uh, another very small um, piece of uh, ruler on the back side, this flattener klappe, uh, which goes the opposite direction. You have also a small, because the air goes this way, so you have a small force in this direction. So in this way, you reduce the force and you get the whole movement of this um, uh, tool uh, ruler more smoother. Uh, and at least from description, from the text, the right, it works almost like a servo nowadays uh, tools. Um, and as mentioned, it's also used still today in very small airplanes. Uh, but of course, you lose some uh, steering by this tools. So of course, it has disadvantages, but still it fulfills uh, the purpose of reducing the forces. So another aspect also from the crying, uh, control system um, is the called uh, the flight control rods. Uh, so it's the uh, same problem as yeah. large airplanes, means large forces are required, but here now, especially the, take a look on the cables, the anchors and deflection points, so all the uh, system. Dietmar, uh, yeah. two, two minutes. Okay, so all the questions uh, are the problems to get the force from the pilot to the, the tool. And here they really did a, a seeker, clearly a seeker, and uh, find a couple of solutions. And they replaced this tool by, instead of using a lightweight cable, they use seeker rods. And instead of lateral movements and rotational movements, so basically a couple of projects they used here. And if you take a look, these kind of approaches are still used today in nowadays airplanes. So anyway, coming to the back, the TRITS tool. So many tools are found. Uh, I think the self-service is the most mainly used. Um, and beside of um, TRITS, also other aspects actually were clearly used. I think I could emphasize it in between, like this FMEA, really is some kind of pre-time FMEA so failure model analysis and also DFMA, so design for manufacturing and assembly, these kind of tools could be identified in the way partly they were used. So of course, as mentioned, they were used these kind of tools, but of course not in the manner as used today. So it was more intuitively used. Um, however, worth to mention in the end, with all this kind of approaches, I get a very reliable airplane and I have no reports about found anything about teasing problems and troubles. Question is clearly, is it related that they use these kind of tools? So the outlook really would be, the question is, if you use this kind of tool, so plenty of TRITS, FMA, DFMA in parallel, that maybe you have a higher probability for have a successful innovative new machine without teasing problems. That's a hypothesis, of course. And the other thing is clearly, again, to look more deeply in, in the work at Bloom and Foss, maybe at other designers, um, if all the work was done here was mainly only initiated as TRITS-like and FMA, DFMA-like work, by the chief engineer, or if it was more the company philosophy, but doesn't seem like, but here we have to do much more work on it or more deeper inside to see if other companies were also 
working in this field and, and using these pre treats tools. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> it's been a really interesting historical overview, uh, especially of that uh, pre trees era. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, any questions? Um, okay. Uh, no questions, rather an explanation to the last question you said. And the thing is, Blom and Foss uh, were never a classical uh, plane builder. They used to be a company that constructed ships. So everything that was about flying, they couldn't uh, rely on experience uh, and like Siemens, where they would say, we have always done it this way. It was new to them at that time. Mm -hmm. And basically, so they had to learn it and they took the best of everything. And they had a higher need to to develop something uh, really from scratch rather than using uh, experience they had grown up in, in ages before. I think this is a pretty simple but pretty efficient uh, explanation why they had were so innovative and why they followed strict uh, construction rules. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I, I think actually when I, when I got the I think at Bloom and Foster were also some smaller airplanes also done, many flying boats. And I think really the key seems to be that with the main chief inventor, or this uh, Vogt, or his name uh, was really a key point that he really bring a lot of experience with it. Um, especially when I see the tubular spar, it was clearly an idea from him, which he had also before, because he was coming directly from Japan um, for construction work and had a big influence of the whole uh, Japanese um, airplane. Um, Instruction. So, um, but anyway, still, but Blum and Foss was also doing some other airplanes before. Um, but of course, I fully agree, it's mainly known for shipbuilding. <laughs> There's a comment from Christoph. Uh, more of a comment. Your enthusiasm sparks of the presentation. I really enjoyed oh. it. That's okay, well, it's nice. Kind of Good to hear. And Horst, devil's advocate question. What about the trees era? How many innovations are generated by purposely, purposely applying trees? Oh, uh, personally, I can only say in our company when we do inventions, there are a couple of examples. Some you can find in, uh, actually, if you search the internet, you can find some. Because we did some defensive publishing also, uh, which not as a patent, but only defensive publishing, you can find it on rated websites where we have done it by trees tool. And some other things are only internal. Yeah. But of course, most of the stuff is tricks. It's actually the problem I see in, in, in daily work is usually when you start to apply with all mechanism and all the formalism, it takes a lot of time. And as it's an issue, might very often you just want to have a fast solution most of the time. Okay. Thanks. Wonderful presentation. I agree. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. So right. I... If there are no more questions, we are precisely with time today. <laughs> <laughs>